Jesus said to the Lord, O Lord, you are the God who gives breath to all creatures. Please appoint a new man as a leader for the community. Give them someone who will guide them wherever they go and will lead them into battle. So the community of the Lord will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Read this next part with me. It's on the screen. The Lord replied, Take Joshua, son of Nun, who has the spirit in him, and lay your hands on him. Present him to Eliezer the priest before the whole community and publicly commission him to lead the people. Tell your neighbor, that sounds way better than elections, and you may be seated. <clears throat> so we are in our series, uh, Led by Fire. Why is he taking so long in this series? Okay, it, <laughs> Moses lived 120 years, okay? Can you give me just a few more weeks here? I've got today, and, and, and I've got another message. And actually, uh, September 8th will be the final message of this series. September 8th, we will... We will have a funeral. We will put this, we will put this series to bed, uh, and you don't want to miss it. Be here September 8th for that, and we will finish up this series about Moses. Why, why do we spend so long? Well, Moses, first of all, he, he wrote half the Old Testament, so he has a lot of influence there. And uh, in fact, you'll see in the New Testament when they, they talk about the law, they, that they often just refer to it as Moses. It says, you have Moses and the prophets. And so he's a significant um, feature in the Bible. But more than that, he had this close relationship with God. He, he and Yahweh, they would speak face to face. He was known as a friend of God. And there's so many lessons to learn as we've journeyed with Moses. Last week, um, we learned some lessons from a donkey. Uh, any of you here for that? Yeah, we learned some lessons from a donkey, right? I mean, man, you can learn from a donkey. Um, I was in the car afterwards, and Ellen said, honey, that was a really good message. I said, I don't know. At times, I felt like I was beating a dead horse. <laughs> but Balaam's donkey teaches us that God will use anything uh, that he pleases to work his will. Um, you know, I, I, we say, I'm the pot, you know, I, you're the potter, I'm the clay. We're, you know, we can all be used as just a tool in God's hand, and he'll use anything to get our attention. Um, we also talked about how there's more going on in this world than we can see. And uh, oddly enough, the, the donkey's eyes were opened before the prophet's eyes uh, to see what else was going on there. Um, we talked about if you're led by fire, don't worry about curses. If God is blessing you, uh, who can curse you? Nobody, except you. Um, beware of the curse you can bring on yourself. When Balaam couldn't curse Israel... He told the king of Moab, uh, how, here's how you can bring down Israel. Entice the men into immorality. And that's what they did, and Israel brought a curse on themselves. Well, today we, we turn to chapter 27. Um, the time of Moses is wrapping up, and it's time for a new leader. And verse 12, on one day the Lord said to Moses, Climb one of the mountains east of the river. Look out over the land I have given to the people of Israel. After you have seen it, you will die like your brother Aaron, for you both rebelled against my instructions in the wilderness of Zin. When the people of Israel rebelled, you failed to demonstrate my holiness to them at the waters. These are the waters of Meribah at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. And we, we talked about that incident where Moses was supposed to speak to the rock and the water would come forward and instead he struck the rock. And we talked about the significance of that. In verse 15, Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, you're the God who gives breath to all creatures. Please appoint a new man as a leader for the community. What, what does he mean? He, he's like, hey, I, I know I'm only here as long as you give me breath. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm leaving this mortal coil, but you know, I've kind of grown attached to these people that you've sent me to lead. So he says, give them someone who will guide them wherever they go, who will lead them into battle. So the community of the Lord will not be like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord replied, uh, take Joshua, son of Nun, who has the spirit in him, and lay your hands on him. By the way, uh, some people say Joshua had no parents because the Bible says he was son of Nun, but that was actually his father's name. A um, little trivia there, help you with uh, some Laffy Taffy jokes later. 
So Moses says, give them someone, and God says, I choose Joshua. Now, if you've been reading the story up till now, you know that this is kind of a rhetorical conversation, right? It, this is, we, we, we kind of knew this was coming. Like, have you ever been in a wedding where the, the pastor says, and, and what symbol of your commitment do you bring? And then they pull out a ring, and they're like, oh, a ring. Like, we never saw that coming. It's like, oh, a ring. What, why, that's perfect. What a great idea. It's unending, and it has no beginning and no end, and it's a symbol of your everlasting love. And whew, wow, what a genius idea that you brought rings to the wedding. Well, if you've been following the story, Joshua has been preparing for this role for years. Their first real battle against the Amalekites, um, who led the troops? It was Joshua that led the troops. You remember uh, that Moses was holding his staff up, and Aaron and Hur were holding up Moses' arms, but it was Joshua down there leading the troops. And in Exodus 24, when we see Moses going back up on the mountain to receive the law from the Lord, who goes with him? Uh, nobody but Joshua. We talked about the tent of meeting where Moses would go to meet with Yahweh, to spend time to seek the Lord. Who was with him there? Joshua. And it even says that after Moses left the tent of meeting, that Joshua would remain behind. Joshua insisted on having his own time with God. Since his youth, Joshua has been right by Moses' side. He's been helping him and serving him and doing whatever was asked of him. When the spies went in to explore the promised land, it was only Caleb and Joshua that came out with faith and saying, you know what, we can take it, we can do this. But notice what Yahweh says about Joshua. Joshua has all this experience. He's been by Moses' side for 40 years. He's been leading the troops into battle. But this next part, it doesn't say, in verse 18, doesn't say what a great warrior he is doesn't say that Joshua was an expert in the law of Moses. Look at what it says. Take Joshua, son of Nun, who, what? Has, has the spirit, spirit in, him. in him and lay your hands on him. The spirit of God in Joshua is what makes the difference. This is why he is selected to lead the people. So they say, verse 19, present him to Eleazar the priest before the whole community and publicly commission him to lead the people transfer some of your authority to him so the whole community of Israel will obey him. So you get the sense here, Moses isn't leaving quite yet. He's got the instruction. The end of your life is coming. You're going to come to this mountain. You're going to go up that mountain and, and, and you're going to go and be with the Lord and shuffle off this earth. Um, but before you get there, you're going to walk a little bit while with, with Joshua and you're going to give him some authority. He's, he's, going to get ready to lead the people by Moses transferring authority to him. Um, this isn't a new concept for Moses. You remember back um, when his father-in-law visited and saw that Moses was deciding every case, everybody who had a complaint, everybody who had their neighbor steal a goat from them was coming to Moses for justice, and Jethro's like, hey, you got to give away some authority. You can't be doing all of this. you got some solid guys here. Find some solid guys find guys that can be trusted, find guys that can't be bribed, okay, and, and entrust some authority to them. And so now Joshua is about to get some senior leader experience. And then verse 21 is kind of a little strange deal. It says, when direction from the Lord is needed, Joshua will stand before Eliezer the priest, who will use the Urim one of the sacred lots cast before the Lord to determine his will. This is how Joshua and the rest of the community of Israel will determine everything they should do. I'll, I'll be honest, this sacred lots, this Urim thing, it's a little strange to me. And we don't have a lot of information from the Bible. This isn't mentioned a whole lot of places. And we don't know exactly how it worked. But the practice of using the Urim or the Urim and the Thumb, it, it disappears after the exile. We don't see it uh, in, the, in the post-exilic prophets. We don't see it in, uh, in the New Testament. The New Testament clearly teaches that we are to go directly to the Lord through Jesus. And the New Testament clearly teaches us that we are to train our ears to hear the voice of the Spirit. So don't major on minor things, okay? Um, I, I've had this happen since I was very young. I've had people come into my life and they will show me some obscure verse with some little thing about Urim or angels or something. 
and they will try to build a whole theology on this and be like, aha, we have this secret thing in here. You can be part of this. Don't, don't be romanced by that, okay? That, that's, just, just live out the simple gospel. If you can live that out, uh, you'll be a rock star in the kingdom of God. So don't get distracted by this because the New Testament clearly teaches us we're to listen for the Lord's voice. You know, sometimes it'd be nice to have like a magic eight ball from the Lord, right? You know, shake it and, you know, it's like, should I do this thing? And it's like, you know, you know it says, you know, could be. And I, okay. Um, <laughs> but that's not God's will for us. It's not God's will for us to divine his will. The, the New Testament clearly um, warns us against divining. So we shouldn't be uh, using magic stones or cards or things like that. We are to flee that sort of thing. But the concept here, take the Urim out of the way. Joshua, when you don't know what to do, ask the Lord. Come to the Lord. When you need wisdom, ask the Lord for wisdom. And he says, get with the priests, okay? So you got some spiritual fathers here. You got some, some guys who have been walking with the Lord, some guys who are daily spending time in God's presence. Get together with them, have a little prayer meeting, and seek the Lord's will. So Moses did what the Lord commanded. He presented Joshua to Eliezer the priest and the whole community. Moses laid his hands on him and commissioned him to lead the people, just as the Lord had commanded through Moses. So Moses is he's starting to pass the mantle publicly. Uh, Israel, here's your new leader. Get ready. Um, how, you know how you followed me? Poorly. Do, do better. <laughs> and follow Joshua. Well, by this time, the people, the rebellious people, most of them have died off, right? We've been wandering around the wilderness, and we've, their graves are scattered around. Um, now, uh, here's Joshua, and, and Moses is letting people know he is God's man for the job, and Moses isn't quite done yet. If we go through Moses' story, we still see that he's got quite a few more instructions from the Lord that he has to write, and then we have the, the book of Deuteronomy where Moses gives this entire sermon. The book of Deuteronomy is either one sermon or a collection of sermons from Moses where he says, hey, before I kick the bucket, I want to recap everything I've done and everything the Lord has taught me, and I want to leave that with you so that you don't forget it. So write it down. Here we go. He also has one more major battle. He's going to go to war against the the Midianites. The Midianites were part of that group that seduced Israel to fall into sin. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how, how God does that. You know, God judged Israel for the sin that he fell into, that they fell into. But God also judged the Moabites and the Midianites that enticed them into that sin. So he holds them accountable. But the most important task at the end of Moses' time has been accomplished. And it's... Uh, what is he doing? He's passing the baton. He says, Moses, you're going to die, but before you go, it's really important that you leave well. And so I, I've entitled the message, Pass the Baton. Um, I've got, a, got my little baton here. And any of you watch some of the Olympics? Two of you. Okay, good, good. I'm sure NBC is glad they spent all that money. Um, we can learn some things from this passage, and we can learn some things from the Olympics. When you're led by fire, you've got to learn how to, how to, how to pass the baton. Um, hey, you guys are familiar with this in the relay race, right? right? Where you got like four guys, and each guy takes the baton, runs as fast as he can, but then they have to pass it to the next guy, and the next guy has to be able to take it. And any any pe people ever actually run track and do the, the passing the baton? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, Ellen, okay, look at that. All right. It does, any, can anybody come show me how you do that? Any volunteers that actually know the technique? I never ran track. I was a solitary individual. I rode my bike. And any track people know how that handoff works? Yeah, there are different ways. Yeah, all the, yeah, all, all the track people suddenly turn into introverts. <laughs> but... You can lose the relay. You could be the fastest team out there, but if you don't pass the baton, you're going to lose the race. And so it's really important that you learn to pass the baton. So here's our first point. How, how do we do this well? Number one is realize you're not here forever. I'm sorry to break it to you. You're going to die. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, you can go home, call your kids, and say, hey, kids, got to tell you some bad news. I'm going to die. I don't know when. Might be 50 years from now. When I'm Addie's age, I don't know. Um, might be tomorrow. We don't know. But at some point, we're going to die. This is an exciting point. You're all like, oh, this is such, I've got to write this down. This is blessing my heart. I'm so glad I'm going to go home from church today. What did you hear about in church today? We're going to die. Um, some of you, I'm starting to wonder if you're ever going to die. But um, I, uh, I showed up in my suit one day, and, and one, of our, one of our older members is like, I, I want you to bury me in that suit. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to live that long. Um, so, so with that knowledge that we're not here forever, we need to lead well now. We need to have faith now. We need to take chances. Uh, Joshua and Caleb, they're like, we can do it. You know, think about back at that story. Joshua and Caleb are like, yeah, you know what? We could go do it. We could go into this land. We could take the land. What if they were wrong? If they were wrong, they would have perished trying to accomplish God's will. Those that played it safe, what did they accomplish? Nothing. They just wandered around the desert for the next 40 years complaining uh, that Moses wasn't feeding them well enough. So take some chances. I, I, you know, one of, one of the, the quotes that I love is from an author. Um, he, he's actually an Assemblies of God guy. His name is Mark Batterson. He pastors a church in New York. And this quote keeps, got stuck in my head. He says, quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Wow. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. I thought, man, how, how often do we do that? We're like, like we want to be careful. We don't want to take chances. We don't want to, we don't want to do something because we, we want to make sure that we are safe and sound until we die. Well, we're going to die someday, so let's take some chances. Let, let's do some things. Let me read the, the full quote. He says this, Quit living as if the purpose of your life is to arrive safely at death. Set God-sized goals. Pursue God-ordained passions. Go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Keep asking questions, keep making mistakes, keep seeking God. Stop pointing out problems and become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past and start creating the future. Stop playing it safe and start taking risks. Expand your horizons, accumulate experiences, enjoy the journey. Find every excuse you can to celebrate everything you can. Live like today is the first day and the last day of your life. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Burn sinful bridges, blaze new trails, Criticize by creating. Worry less about what people think and more about what God thinks. Don't try to be what you're not. Be yourself. Laugh at yourself. Oh, that could be a whole other sermon right there. <laughs> Laugh at yourself. How many of our problems come from the fact we take ourselves way too seriously? Don't let fear dictate your decisions. Take a flying leap of faith. Chase the lying, the lion. And again, Quit living as if the purpose of your life is to arrive safely at death. It's saying most, make the most of today. It's the, the whole series, when you're, when you're led by fire, let's do something for God. Let's have faith. Let's take some chances. Let's serve God well in the time that we have. But we need to be aware that the mission isn't going to be done in our lifetime. It's not going to be done in our lifetime. So we need to be intentional about handoffs. Now, in the Olympics, what is the job of each person? They have two jobs, right? Right. Run fast, and pass, pa pass the baton, right? Run fast, pass, the, pass it cleanly. We're not here forever. While we're here, we're in a relay, and we need to run fast and hard, but our purpose is about the team, not just our own time. What happens if the runner doesn't pass the baton well? Yeah, they fail. Does, does anyone talk about what a great leg you ran if you didn't pass the baton well? No, nobody's like, oh, you know what? He fumbled the pass, but did you see how fast his leg was? It was a really fast, it was a great fast leg. Nobody cares about how fast a leg they ran if they didn't pass it off. Nobody talks about that because you're part of a relay. 
Now, we got this baton from someone, and, and hopefully someone who ran well and handed it off well. Now that it's our turn, it's not just about us. We need to be preparing for the handoff. Some people lead like you're going to have to pry the baton from their cold, dead fingers. Have you ever seen that? And, and I'm talking about in general in life, but let's talk about in the church. Have you ever seen some people in some positions at church where, you know, oh, it's their job to do this? And, and I'll tell you, as a pastor, sometimes I'm like, hey, you know, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, I appreciate that you're helping us in this area, but you know what I'd really like to see you do is I'd like you to develop a team. I'd like you to recruit some other people and train some other people how to do that job. And they're like, no, that's my job. It's my thing. When I, you know, that's, that's my special little role in church, and nobody is going to take it from me. But that's not a kingdom attitude. If you lead like that, I promise you, we will forget you. We will forget you. We'll remember the time. We'll remember how you gripped that baton. We'll remember how you refused to let it go. Um, I've, I've had to deal with this in ministry over the years. I had a sound guy that was so controlling, he wouldn't let anybody touch the board, that he put, he put a plexiglass cover over the soundboard, and he had a key to it, and he was the only one with the key to it. I asked him for a key because I was a worship leader at the church. And I said, you know what? Sometimes you're not going to be there. I'm going to need to fire up the soundboard and I'm going to have to make some adjustments. He wouldn't give me a key. One night I came in, he wasn't there. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. So how many of you know, I got power tools. <laughs> I came and disassembled that cover at the screws and took that, that thing off and I adjusted it and we had rehearsal. The next morning he came to my office with a key. He, he had to be forced to, to pass the baton. Um, and it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's sad uh, in the history of that church what happened is when they built a new facility, the sound booth was upstairs, which is, by the way, wrong, okay? If, if there, there are two types of church facilities, facilities with the sound booth on the floor and facilities that will eventually have the sound booth on the floor. The architect says, oh, we could hide that back up in there. But you, the problem is you can't hear what's going on in the room from up there. But they built a facility, and it was up there. And about the time that they built that facility and the sound booth was up a whole bunch of stairs, this guy who was so controlling had a motorcycle accident and couldn't climb stairs. And, and while I was very sad about that, at the same time, I just went, I, I can see the hand of the Lord working. If, if you don't pass that baton... Uh, God will engineer that baton out of your hands. Um, so you got to be intentional. You got to lead well, you got to hand it off. Now, as I'm talking about this, I'm talking about leadership. And, and one of the things, if you've come here for a little while, um, I might talk to most of you with this assumption that you're a leader. And maybe you feel like, well, I don't know that I'm a leader. Well, there's, there's two things going on here. First of all, as a pastor, and this message will make it clear, my intention is for every one of you to lead something somewhere, okay? I, I believe I am talking to a, a, a group of leaders. Maybe you're only uh, leading a small bit. Maybe you're leading a lot of people. Maybe, maybe you're leading an organization. Maybe you're leading your household. You're leading in some way, and God has given you gifts and abilities, and God has given you a ministry, and he expects you to replicate that ministry into other people. And so when I speak to each of you, I speak to you as a leader. And, and maybe you're thinking, well, I don't lead a nation, I don't lead a church, but you lead something, and God has given you gifts and a ministry. Now, 2 Timothy 2.2 is a passage that I love to quote. Um, and I only realized for this message that it's 2.2.2. And I thought, well, that's kind of appropriate. Um, 2 Timothy 2.2 says this, And the things you've heard me say, this is Paul talking to Timothy, and Paul says, hey, Timothy, what you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust that to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. It's this, this ministry of multiplication. Paul is telling Timothy, hey, take the baton and give it to somebody who will give it to somebody who will give it to somebody. He, he, is, he is engineering in this multiplication standards, okay? 
All right. So he, he says 2, 2, 2. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. multiply, multiply, multiply. This is a relay race. Take my teaching, pass it to others with the intention that they will pass it to others. Okay? All right. So, uh, Clint, you know I'm coming there eventually, right? So, <laughs> so if I'm passing the baton to Clint, I, I, I want to get a good handoff, and I want Clint to take this thing, but what do I want Clint to do? I want him to run the race and pass it. Now, just pass it around the whole congregation. Now, let me give a, a, a quick little speech here on, on hygiene because you, you, there's hand sanitizer back there you know, at the welcome table if you want it. If somebody doesn't, doesn't want to touch the thing that everybody else in the room touched, will you just have some grace? No, behind you, Don, behind you. Behind, there you go. Uh, have, have some, let, if anybody wants to touch it, let them touch it. If somebody's like, you know what, I'm fighting a cold and I'd rather not share it, that's okay. All right. By the way, that goes to greeting time, too. Can I just put in a little, we'll take a little pause, okay? We're going to take a little station break for, for, for a public service message. Um, during greeting time, if you go to shake somebody's hand and they just want to fist bump you or their hands are behind their back and they're like, good to see you, means they don't want to shake your hand. Don't shame them. Don't be like, oh, come on, come in here, give me a hug, okay? All right. Um, practice a little bit of consent in your greeting. Let's just have consensual greeting, all right? And the person who nods at you says, so good to see you, okay? They might be sparing you from a disease that they are carrying. So respect that. Respect that. Respect your neighbors. Now, if somebody wants to shake a hand, shake a hand, okay? You know, okay, um, you know, Bobby, Betty, you know every day I see you, I'm going to hug you, right? Okay, so, and, but I have consent with that. At least with, with Betty I do. I don't know about Bobby. But I, uh, they've been very kind to allow me to do that. But you know, I, I have some friends that okay, I'll see them, I'll go to shake their hand, and they'll just kind of give me a little fist bump. That's okay. All right, PSA is over. Please practice consensual greeting. All right, so who's going to pick up the baton and run with it? Um, I'll give you an example in our church. Our deacons, okay, our, our deacons are not young people, and we want to, we, we, would, we, would, we would like to see more young people come on the board. Now, if our deacons were, uh, you know, power-hungry control people, they'd be like, no, you're going to pry this from my cold, dead hands, but they would actually, that's not the heart of our board. Our board is like, oh man, we are praying and we are dreaming about how God will eventually bring some more people on that board and younger people on that board. Um, and so I'm praying uh, over the years that God will raise that up. We do this as pastors. At pastors, we, we've done this poorly, especially in smaller churches. Churches have not done this well. When a pastor is older and he's getting ready for retirement, a lot of times that pastor retires and the church has no plan in place. And they kind of got to start from ground zero to go try to find somebody. Um, now, a lot of churches are trying to put in place a succession plan, where before the senior pastor retires, they bring in a younger pastor who will be the next leader. Sometimes that works really well, other times it doesn't, but, but we're getting better at figuring that thing out well. We're getting better at handing off the baton. Um, I've known churches that have said they were going to do that, and a younger minister came in expecting to be the senior pastor in three or four years, and then five, six years go by, and the senior pastor is just not letting go of that baton. Um, so, so you got to be, you, you got to have people who are ready to take it, but we got to be, we got to be ready to hand off that baton. We got to figure that out. We have to figure out how to honor that older minister, right? We don't want to take somebody and be like, "You're too old," kick you to the curb, right? We we got to figure out how to care for them well. But we also got to be ready for the next step because we're not going to be here forever. So we have to be intentional about passing the baton. Number three, look for those who are close. So I, I, as I'm talking to you, you're thinking about, okay, what has God entrusted to you? What is your ministry? Are, what is, what is, what is, are you a teacher? Uh, are you a prayer warrior? What, what is your thing? And you're thinking, how do I pass that off? Who, who do I look for? Look for those who are close. And when I say close, I mean close to you and close to God. Look at Joshua. Joshua has been close to Moses every step of the way for the last 40 years. But he's not just been close to Moses. He's also been close to God. He's been cultivating his own relationship with Yahweh. He's been staying behind at the prayer tent to spend time with the Lord. 
He, he is hanging out. He's the ideal candidate. And when I challenge you to replicate yourself and others, start with those who are already near you, but look for those who are going after God. I, I wish we all had a multiplication radar, okay? And, and again, this, is, this, this applies to evangelism and discipleship. If you've been here, you've heard me talk about evangelism and discipleship are the same thing when you think about it, right? It's just evangelism is we're trying to disciple people that aren't yet saved, right? But we want, we want to take them from being far from God to close to God to making a decision for Christ, but then we don't want to leave them there. We want to disciple them and help them to mature in their Christian faith. But it's all the same continuum. It's all the same process. It, it all requires building a relationship with them and influencing them to follow Jesus as we are following Jesus. So, we need to have multiplication radar. Who is, who is the young man following me around? Ladies, who's the young lady? What can we do? Let's, let's work with them. Let's teach them about what we do. Let's, let's uh, give them some responsibility. And after they've proven themselves with responsibility, let's give them some authority and then watch uh, them multiply themselves into somebody else. I learned this uh, principle when I was a youth pastor in Wisconsin. I had been a youth pastor there for about eight or nine years, and I knew God was calling me to uh, go out and be a worship pastor somewhere. I was already leading worship. I had developed a Saturday night uh, service and was leading that team, and it was all musicians that I had raised up and trained, and we were having a great time, but I knew I was leaving. And, but I loved my church, and so when I knew I was leaving, before anybody else knew I was leaving, I began to think, man, when I'm out of here, how is the youth ministry going to do? How is the worship team going to do? So in the youth ministry, I started giving away some responsibility. I started having different people do different aspects of it, and I had small group leaders and youth sponsors, and I had student leaders. And by the time I left that church, I would show up on a Wednesday night and do almost nothing. I was the door greeter. And, and I would show up, and somebody else was leading worship, and somebody else did announcements, and somebody else took up the offering, and somebody else took attendance, and somebody else did the teaching. And you know what was really weird? The more ministry I gave away, the more the youth group grew. And when I left that church, I, I, it was in the hands of volunteers and student leaders, and we were gone, and like in the first six months after we left, the youth group grew without a hired official full-time youth pastor. And I thought, isn't that cool? And then with the worship team, I had the same thing. And I had a couple people on my team that I thought, these people would be qualified. And I talked to the pastor, and I said, Pastor, which of these people do you, do you see being the leader after I'm gone? And, and, and he's like, well, probably Al, because I think Tamara is ready to lead something else. So probably Al would be the worship leader. So I started working with Al, and I let him lead a song one week. And then I let him lead a couple songs another week. And then I went out of town, and I said, Al, I want you to lead the team while I'm out of town. And I videotaped it, and I watched the videotape back, and, you know, there were some problems. It was a little rough. And so I sat down with Al, and I said, hey, Al, here's how you do this. Here's how you handle transitions. Here's how this could have gone more smoothly. Here's how you could fix this problem. And I continued to let Al lead here and there. And then I went out of town again, and I let Al lead. And I came back, and I watched the video and it was one of the most beautiful worship services I've ever seen. And as I'm watching it, I felt like the Lord was asking me, like, are you going to be okay if he does this better than you? And I'm like, oh, you know what? It, it hurts, but I kind of think that would be the best thing. I think that would actually be really awesome if, if I entrusted this to him and, and it got better. And, and I left that church and Al did a great job with that team, and he's still leading worship to this day and gives me credit for putting that in his hands. And, and, and um, it, it's, it's been wild. The church that I left when, in, in uh, Iowa, when I left that church, it went through some hard times. And they didn't hire another worship pastor for several years because the volunteers that I had raised up were doing a great job at it. And when they finally did hire somebody full time, it was it was one of the guys. It was my Joshua, his name is Brian. His, it was my Joshua, and they hired him. Um, had the same thing in in Temple. Since the church I left in Temple, I've been gone for six years. They've had two full time worship pastors over the course of about two and a half years. 
most of the time I've been gone, it's been people that I raised up that have been leading worship there. The girl who is currently the interim worship leader is a, a little girl who was in fine arts with me as a teenager and was on one of my fine arts worship teams. That's why I believe in fine arts so much. I've seen it launch so many kids into ministry, and she's doing a great job. This is something that has just become passionate to me, and every time I've worked my way out of a job, do you know that God has promoted me? He's given me more responsibility. He has cared for me. He has blessed me, and so um, God has more for you, so don't worry. Don't worry. If you can pass your baton well, God's going to give you some other things to do until he's ready to take you home, all right? If you pass the baton well, he's going to raise up somebody, so keep looking for that next runner. They're probably close to you, and they're going after God. And the final point is be ready to receive, okay? This is for those of you coming behind. This is for those of you who, who need to be ready to grab that baton. You know, um, more than anything, make sure you've got the Spirit of God in you. I love the story of Elijah and Elisha. I just was reading that in my devotions this last week. And I just love how... Elisha, see, Elijah is Israel's prophet. He's the big guy. He's the man uh, with the plan. Anybody wants a word from God, they go to Elijah, and man, that guy, he can make the sun stand still. I mean, it's just, he's amazing. And so they go to Elijah, and they're following him, but Elijah has his assistant with him, Elisha, and Elisha's going everywhere that Elijah goes. And he stuck close to Elijah, and he was faithful. And then when he saw that God was going to take his master home, his mentor, his leader, you know what he asked for? He asked for a double portion of God's anointing. He was hungry. So be hungry. Young leaders, be hungry. Not for position or status. Be hungry for God's anointing. Because if God anoints you, you're going you're gonna to have a, a place to run. You're gonna, somebody's going to hand you a baton. We're not going to be here forever. While you're here, grab that baton and run with it. But let's be intentional about passing that off. Amen? All right, good news. There's a finish line. Um, we're not all going to cross at the same time, but we're, we're all going to be winners. You know, that's the great thing about this racing analogy is, is a great analogy. Paul uses it, and there's other, other places in the Bible that use it, but where it breaks down is we're not racing against each other. We're not competing with one another. We're not trying to outdo each other. W what are we racing against? We're, 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 our, we're just trying to fulfill God's call on our life. We're trying to run well. We're trying to get to that finish line and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So whatever stage you are, maybe you're a young person today and you haven't seen yourself as a leader and I'm, I'm speaking to you and I'm saying, no, God's gifted you. Pick up that baton and run with it. Maybe you're married and you have kids. And let me tell you, I don't feel guilt like, oh man, I should be, feel, I should be more involved in church but I got these little kids. Well, you know what? You're, lead your kids well. Okay, do that first. When Paul gives instructions for finding leaders in the church, he says, look for people who are leading their families well. That's the first thing that you need to be. That's your first ministry, your first responsibility. That's your first call. Lead them well. Maybe like me, you're an empty nester, okay? Um, I hate being an empty nester. I like my nest full, but you know what it does give me? It gives me lots of time, Okay, Ellen and I can hang out here at church at any hour of the day. We don't have to worry about picking the kids up from school or making sure they're fed or anything like that. We can just, you know, we, we can run well in the, in the time of life we are. Maybe you're nearing the finish line. Well, hey, you know what? Keep running the race, keep running the race, keep running the race, and keep looking for who you can hand the baton to. Run well, hand it off. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bow your heads with me. I just, before I, I close this service out, I just want to give an invitation. If you're in this place today and you say, you know what, Pastor, I've, I've, never, uh, I've, I've never started the race with Christ. I've never trusted the Lord with my heart. I've never asked Jesus to, to be my Lord and my Savior, but that's, that's me today. And you would say, you know, I, I want to pray that prayer and receive Jesus. If that's you, would you just lift a hand? I don't really always ask for a hand, but if anybody here, just lift a hand. If you're with us or you're online and that you say, Pastor, that's me. I want to receive Jesus. Just pray a prayer. Just ask the Lord. Say, Lord, I, I surrender. I come to you. I need a Savior. I know I fall short. I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't do it myself. But thank you for Jesus. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. 
Would you forgive me and, and, and take away my sins? And I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And if you pray that prayer, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins, and he has made you a child of God. And what you need to do now is tell somebody about it. You need to tell somebody, hey, I decided to follow Jesus. Now, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us through this passage? Lord, are we running to make a difference? Are we actively looking to hand off the baton? God, I pray that you'd multiply what you've given us by helping us to invest in others. Help us to run well. In Jesus' name. Before we close, I want to see, where is that baton? Uh, okay, I just want to, I, I want to tell you a funny story real quick, and we can keep this online. Are we still online? Yeah. Okay. So, for this illustration, I had this idea earlier this week, and I ordered an uh, actual uh, baton off of Amazon, the, the aluminum official size and weight track baton. And my package got lost somewhere between Humble, Texas and here. <laughs> I don't know where it is. Amazon, I don't know. Jesus knows where it is. But I'm here yesterday, and I'm working out back. I'm, I'm putting together some conduit and burying some conduits so that I can run a network cable out to our new generator, okay? Because it's 2024, and the generator needs internet access. Um, so... I'm out there, and I'm cutting conduit, and I'm burying it, and I'm gluing it together, and I cut off a piece of conduit about this long, and I look at that, and I thought, I didn't have to order a baton. I could have just cut a piece of conduit. <laughs> and, and so I, I came inside, and I have some white conduit, so I, so I cut off this piece and I cleaned it up a little bit, used a little bit of goof off to try to get some of the lettering off of here, and I thought, that's a perfectly fine baton, right? You, you guys got that this was a baton. And there's nobody here who's like, you know, that's not official size and weight, Pastor Andrew. <laughs> I just can't receive the word unless it's official size and weight. So, I, so sometimes I, I have a, a AG lead pastors group, and I'll, I'll post a picture of my sermon illustration and just say, hey, what am I preaching on? So I posted a picture of this yesterday, and, I, and what am I preaching on? I got all kinds of good answers. Some of them thought it was going to be a lightsaber. Uh, <laughs> so, some of them thought I was going to beat you with it. Um, but but, but uh, one of them is like, yeah, um, your sermon is can't do it, you can do it. <laughs> and I thought, that's a good pun. But you know what else is a good illustration about it is that it's the same principle. We're a conduit, yeah. right? This doesn't exist to be filled up. It exists for things to flow through it. Yeah. While we're running our race, what we want, we want the power of God to flow through us to others. We're just a conduit for what God is doing. You know, I was, we, were, we were in a board meeting once, and we were talking about how God was blessing the church, and uh, Brother Rob, uh, and Rob will be with us next week, by the way. You, you want to make sure you're here. Um, Rob says, you know, what, one of the reasons I think God has blessed Spring Creek Fellowship is because um, everything that we take in goes out, okay? We take in thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars of money in missions, and that comes in the door, and it goes out the door. We're just a conduit. For what God is doing. And, and so our goal isn't to amass as big an elaborate facility as we can. Our goal is to just let God flow through us, let the ministry flow through us, and, and, and that we can each be a conduit. So that's your extra bonus uh, uh, illustration that this little piece of leftover pipe that I, I turned into a baton because Amazon lost my package. Um, <clears throat> Well, it saved the church 15 bucks. It wasn't that much, but, you know, I canceled the order, saved the church 15 bucks. So, so yes, we, we, we conduit. Amen? Amen. 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 Online folks, God bless you. All right. So one more word just for the...